In the next two videos, we're going to be talking about groups of organisms that were previously thought to be fungi, but no longer are considered to be so. And we'll look at why that is. Uh, but these are things that are going to end in mycota because that would have indicated that they were a type of fungus. So when I say many of my seed, we're thinking about things that were given that mycota designation, but that aren't actually fungi. So these are our heterotrophic protists. Remember that protist isn't a real group. That's most of the tree of life for eukaryotes that we know of um, would have belonged to this group of protists and many of them are multicellular. And there's not a good way to group them together because they're not actually related. And this um, image that you're seeing here, I put a link to on the side, uh, but it's a really beautiful um, illustration of the diversity of slime molds. So an overview in this lecture, we're going to talk about the oomycetes, and then in the next video, we'll look at the myxomycetes and the dictostelomycetes. So those are our slime molds. All right, so we're going to be doing some drawing and writing in this one. So our body plan for the oomycota, we have a unicellular or they're going to be filamentous, much like a fungus. They won't have septation, so they'll be cenocytic. So you cenocepta. For their, ooh, another important part about their body plan, um, when they make swimming spores, um, fungi would make a swimming spore with just one regular flagellum, just like us. Um, but when oh, my seeds do, they will make spores that have two different types of flagella. So there's two flagella, and then one is whiplash flagellum, and the other is a tinsel flagellum. So this is often called um, a heterocont flagellum. Hetero means different, and then cont is the flagellum part. So um, we and fungi are part of the epistocons, which means we just have one flagellum, but heterocons have two. And um, that's how we'll, one of the ways that we'll identify them. Uh, for the environment, they are going to be primarily aquatic, but we'll see one big group that has moved to being terrestrial. Another name for the oomycetes is water molds. Um, so they need water for their life cycle, uh, but they figured out some tricky ways to uh, adapt to life on land. Energy acquisition, they are going to be heterotrophic by absorption, just like fungi. So instead of ingesting and engulfing they are going to excrete or secrete uh, digestive enzymes and then soak up their nutrients. They'll store their carbohydrates as glycogen, just like us and just like fungi. But unlike fungi, their cell walls are made of cellulose. Ecologically, they have a very similar function to fungi. They're saprotrophs, which means they eat dead stuff and um, some very important parasites, notably no mutualists that I know of. Um, something else to throw in here, their life cycle, which we're going to cover, is diplontic. So fungi, true fungi, have a haplontic life cycle where they're either haploid or dicaryotic, um, but most of the time, oh, my seats, are going to be diploid. So there's a little bit of review on that for you to see later without my crazy handwriting. So we are going to draw the saprolegnia life cycle. I'm going to set it up like we normally do with meiosis on this side. Oof. And I'm leaving myself a lot of room on the bottom because it's a diplontic life cycle. And fertilization Oh geez, hard to write on this side of the screen. So fertilization on that side. So we'll start out by drawing the top half of this because it's the smallest part because they have a diplontic life cycle. So that means, I'm gonna write diplontic up here just to remind us, sorry, I'm covering the camera. So that means that they're only going to have one haploid 
stage. And that haploid stage is um, their gametes that they make, and then those gametes have to fuse together. So those are the only haploid cells. The eggs are these large haploid cells made inside a structure called an oogonium. So the oomycetes, they make an oogonium, and that's this globostructure, and the eggs are produced inside it by meiosis. So meiosis happens inside the oogonium to make eggs, and it also happens inside a structure called an antheridium. This is a lot of new terminology, but we'll luckily use a lot of it again for other groups. So this is an antheridium. It's like a hyphal filament that has a pad, it's a swollen pad at the end, and a bunch of male nuclei are produced inside it by meiosis as well. So those are male nuclei, and they're also haploid. So those male nuclei are going to be deposited inside of the oogonium and they're going to fuse with the egg. So when those nuclei fuse with the eggs, that is going to be fertilization because we have plasmogamy when the cytoplasm of those two structures fuse together and then karyogamy when we get the nuclei fusing together. So within the oogonium, fertilization happens and we get these really thick walled structures once they're fertilized, so these are now diploid. And these are called oospores. And this is essentially the same thing as a zygote. We have this thick walled spore um, that is going to germinate and grow. So all spores are going to grow, right? So gametes fuse, spores grow. So our oospore is released. It's going to grow by mitosis. Whoa, that totally says mitosis. And then it will grow into this xenocytic diploid thallus. So it's a diploid thallus, and we call it a thallus because it's not differentiated into um, different tissues. It's just sort of this um, whatever structure, I don't know. And so this diploid thallus can reproduce asexually by making a structure called a zygo, not a zygo, a zoosporangium. And that zoosporangium makes spores inside called zoospores, and they're called zoospores because they're swimming spores, so they move around. And they do that with their two flagella. And I'm going to skip a stage here. They have this stage where they come out and then they insist and then they reform into a, a new shape, but who cares? And those zoospores are diploid, just like everything else down here, and they can grow by mitosis into a thallus. So anything that says spore at the end, it is going to grow by mitosis into a thallus. And our diploid thallus here can start making some structures. So they can reproduce, some of them can reproduce with themselves. Some of them have to find a complementary mating type to reproduce with. So we have our oogonium. and our antheridium. And meiosis is going to happen within those structures. Oh, it's beautiful. So here's another diagram of that that you could practice labeling if you want to. Um, so you want to know what your haploid stage is, your eggs and sperm. So um, they're just male nuclei because they are, they're not packaged in a structure like a sperm would be. 
so eggs and your male nuclei, um, and those are the gametes. So they're your haploid stage, and they're the only haploid cells. Those are going to fuse together to make an oospore, which is the same thing as a zygote. That's your first diploid cell. That's going to germinate and grow into a diploid thallus, and that diploid thallus can either make oogonia and antheridia and sexually reproduce, and it'll do that by meiosis, or it can make a zoosporangium and make zoospores that can then grow into another diploid thallus, and it would do that by mitosis. So here's some pictures of those structures. They are really weird looking and beautiful. Um, so in the upper right here, you see the oogonium, that's that globo structure, and it has um, oospores inside, and you can tell because they have a really dense wall. Then on top of that structure, you see here, it's the antheridium, and so it's just this swollen end of one of the hyphal filaments, and uh, meiosis happens inside it, creates a bunch of these haploid nuclei that then get deposited into the oogonium. So those oospores can germinate, grow into a cenocytic diploid thallus, um, and if you're lucky when you're looking at the slides, you would see a zoosporangium. They can be really hard to find, um, but they happen at the end of the hyphal filaments, um, and you can see they're really densely packed here with some forming zoospores. When those get released, um, they're a bit too small to see the flagella, um, but if we could see those flagella, maybe with like a scanning electron microscope or maybe at 1000x, um, we might be able to see, at least that they had two, but I don't know if we'd be able to see the um, tinsel.